Our lectern uh, camera seems to have uh, stopped cooperating, so I'm going to start our webinar by standing in the audience or in the pit in front of the audience. Uh, hello, everybody. My name's Stepan Wood. I'm the director of the Centre for Law and the Environment at uh, the University of British Columbia, coming to you as an uninvited guest on the unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And I would invite uh, folks to reflect for a moment on whose territory they're coming from today, and uh, particularly in connection with the realization that Indigenous peoples generally, and Indigenous youth in particular, are disproportionately vulnerable to and impacted by the effects of global climate change and fossil fuel combustion. Um, and that is actually uh, the center of the topic of our webinar today. I have to say I'm feeling kind of weird with my back to the audience, but you'll forgive me, I hope. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this is the second in a webinar series called In Their Own Voices, Plaintiffs and Their Lawyers Speak About Youth Climate Cases. The series features uh, four leading um, climate change cases uh, brought by children and youth in Canada and the United States. Last week we heard from one of the plaintiffs and a lawyer in the Mather against Ontario case. This week, we are joined by a plaintiff and a plaintiff's lawyer in the case of La Rose against Canada. And in the following two weeks, we will be joined by uh, folks involved in two of the leading cases in the United States, the Held case from Montana and the Juliana case from the U.S. Federal Court in the District of Oregon. Um, this webinar series really gives us an unusual, unique opportunity to hear from the young people themselves who have the courage to stand up and challenge their governments legally in court for the roles that they are playing in causing and contributing to uh, catastrophic climate change. Um, La Rose is a case that was started in October of 2019, and I remember the day it was filed, the youth and their lawyers gathered on the steps of the Vancouver Art Gallery and spoke to a gathered, a large gathered crowd uh, about what they were doing and why. But basically, the La Rose case argues that the federal government through a wide range of conduct related to climate change, everything from the setting of targets for greenhouse gas emissions reductions all the way through to actually investing in and owning fossil fuel uh, infrastructure projects, um, is contributing to um, climate change in a way that violates the rights to life, liberty, security of the person, and equality of uh, young people. The case was brought by 15 young people from across Canada, um, and uh, it, um, in addition to arguing that the government's conduct violates their rights under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it's also claims that the public trust doctrine forms part of Canadian law and the federal government is violating its duties to the plaintiffs under the public trust doctrine. It asks the Federal Court of Canada to declare that the government's conduct violates the charter and its public trust duties and to order the government to prepare and implement a climate recovery plan to reduce Canada's GHG emissions and decarbonize its economy um, in line with what scientists say is necessary to stabilize the climate system and protect the rights of youth. In December of 2023, the Federal Court of Appeal issued a landmark ruling in this case that is allowing it to proceed to trial, albeit on a narrower basis than originally argued, and that narrower basis relates to Section 7 of the Charter, the right to life, liberty, and the security of the person. 
We're going to hear first from Sadie Vipond, who's one of the plaintiffs in the case, and then from Chris Tollefson, one of the plaintiff's lawyers. I'll introduce Sadie briefly and let her speak, and then before Chris speaks, I'll introduce him. So Sadie is a 17-year-old grade 12 student who lives in Calgary, Alberta, a city and region well known for oil and gas extraction. She's one of the 15 plaintiffs suing the federal Canadian government for a safe climate future for her and all other youth. She has a passion for the outdoors, whether it's skiing in the mountains, hiking the badlands, searching for dinosaur fossils, or anything in between, that's where Sadie is the happiest. In November of 2021, she attended the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow in order to learn more and amplify youth's voice on climate. She's working toward a safe climate future for all creatures and to try and prevent the worst effects of the climate emergency. With that, I will turn it over to Sadie. I'll note that those of you joining us online can put questions in the Q&A feature in the webinar at any time. After both present presentations are done, we'll invite uh, questions from the live audience in the room here at the Allard School of Law, and we'll also moderate questions that are put into the Q&A um, uh, in the webinar. So thank you very much for joining us, Sadie. It's a real honor and over to you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, so yeah, I've been involved in climate action ever since I was 12. I first started um, speaking to my city council about climate and I'm still continuing today. So I, with that, I started with LaRose versus His Majesty the King at 13 years old, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience today. Um, so I decided to sue the government because I couldn't contribute to the political space in the typical way. As I said, I was 13 when I started, so I couldn't vote. So I just turned 18 last week. But when youth have these worries, it's really hard for them to contribute to the political spaces where we can have our voices heard. This is made worse when youth aren't always taken seriously by adults, especially when it comes to political issues like the climate crisis, which we're so worried about. This is a huge problem because youth are affected disproportionately by the climate crisis, we will be around longer and therefore bear the brunt of the effects of climate change. And we will also inherit a world where we have contributed the least amount to the problems that are created by the governments and the corporations. And so taking these matters to court is really important because the youth are able to do it. And I think it's a great way to try and create change. So when I say that the governments and corporations are contributing to most to the climate crisis, the government is contributing to um, climate change in that Canada has known for decades about the harm that fossil fuel industries are causing and the impact that climate change will and has had on youth and vulnerable populations. Uh, the government isn't taking dramatic enough measures to meet global and national goals, such as the Paris Agreement. Um, and so it isn't enough for us to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is supposed to be our goal, but it isn't a dramatic enough and harmful promotion of fossil fuels and failures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the government has contributed enormously to the climate crisis. And so um, in all, the government has violated my and my fellow plaintiffs' charters to rights to life, liberty, and security of the person by contributing to the climate crisis and by continuing to support and promote fossil fuels. And so for decades, the federal government has known that climate change and fossil fuel use threatens the life and personal security of children. And, but it 
still continues to take actions that harm our generation and those to come. And per on a personal level, um, climate change is harming myself. And so our case has the basis that our rights are being violated because youth are experiencing from effects from the climate crisis now, which will be continuing disproportionately into the future. So a lot of people think that climate change is something of the future, but it's really, it really is a present issue. Billions of people are being affected every day, physically and mentally. And I just want to acknowledge first off that the types of experiences I've had with the climate crisis are not as intense, um, way less intense than so many people around the world. My life isn't being threatened by the climate crisis, whether so many people, their lives are being threatened, but still it really affects me in a physical and mental way. So I would like to start off with flooding. Um, I've experienced a lot of flooding in my life. The climate, so climate change triggers large drought events, but also large rain events. So in Calgary, there was the 2013 flood, and I ended up having to evacuate my house because I live in the River Valley. And I was seven years old. I was woken up by my grandmother in the middle of the night and was told that we needed to get to higher ground. I was so scared that our house would be destroyed. And I remember from our friend's place that we had evacuated to, I watch, was watching drone videos of the river with the, with the hippos from the Calgary Zoo nearly escaping. So school is canceled, um, and in the end, our house was thankfully not damaged, uh, although we had to throw out the food in our freezer that had melted because the power had gone out. Um, but like I said, many people had a lot worse, and in all, it was the costliest weather event in Calgary's history. But saying that we know with the climate crisis that there is going to be a lot more that comes we were really close to having a similar event in 2022 with um, extreme rainfall and i'm really worried and i know that it will happen again with more disaster effects disastrous effects affecting more people and being even more costly to our city um the next thing I've experienced is wildfire smoke. So Calgary has received wildfire smoke from more than 1,500 kilometers away, which is pretty crazy from Northern Alberta, British Columbia, the Northwest Territories, California, and Washington state. It changes the color of the sun and air quality forcing me to stay inside for days and I can't exercise or like um, bike to school stuff that I love um, and I volunteer at an animal shelter and this summer I was helping dogs that had been evacuated from fire torn areas such as Yellowknife with so many injuries there is one dog that was stuck in a fence and had um, cuts all down his leg because he had been running from the fire um, and got stuck in the fence. Um, so as the animal shelter, we numbered the dogs and spread them on social media to try and reunite them with their owners. So we reunited the dogs with a lot of their owners but yeah it was really hard to see these dogs that were traumatized physically and mentally they were so scared to even go outside for a little walk as well so that was really hard to see and um, another effect from climate change is the extreme or unnatural heat or temperatures um, it makes me not be able to exercise outside and this summer, I, 
I had a, was scheduled to go to Utah with my family, but unprecedented temperatures made the rivers evaporate. So we had to cancel that. And I know it's normal for Vancouver, but rain in winter is not normal for Calgary. And I've been able to see it increase over the past couple of years. I was skiing over this past weekend and I was skiing in a full downpour of rain, which is super dangerous um, and so abnormal for Calgary. And with the extreme temperatures, it's not with global warming, it's not just warming, it's also extreme temperature fluctuations. So two weeks ago in Calgary, we had negative 40 temperatures. So it was super dangerous to walk outside. And it was like some of the coldest in Calgary's history. And now, two weeks later, we're in a period of above zero. And it was 14 degrees yesterday. So it's like, it's crazy. Um, so I know all of these things, disasters that forced me from my home, dirty air, changing landscapes have not been caused solely by the climate crisis, but their severity and regularity have increased because of the climate crisis. With these regular, very visual reminders of the climate crisis, it's always hanging over my head like a ticking time bomb. So that brings me to one of the biggest effects of the climate crisis for me and a lot of my fellow plaintiffs is with the mental health and eco-anxiety. So 2023 was the hottest year on record and 2024 is predicted to be it. I hear these things on the news, but I'm also seeing this happen in my city and in my country with the rain and the temperatures. And it's very stressful for me because I've, I heard about this issue in science class that the world temperatures are changing, but I can also see it. And it's, it's really scary for me and it's it makes a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that um, I'm seeing the severity, but also I'm seeing how governments and corporations aren't taking it seriously enough to, pr to protect my future because the youth are being affected disproportionately. I have friends that are worried to have children because of this climate crisis. So it's very horrifying for a lot of us. And I believe that all the plaintiffs in this case feel this to some degree. And the knowledge and fear that the events will become worse and more frequent, affecting more people and to a higher degree. And it's scary that I know that governments won't um, work to the degree that they need to, to avoid these effects. And so I really care for the environment. So I've also seen climate effects in that I've seen whole mountainsides destroyed by pine needles. Um, they destroy trees, but they also thrive in higher temperatures. I've also seen um, destruction of habitats and how from floods. And I've also seen um, how the diversity is dropping with we're in the sixth mass, mass extinction of our planet and it's caused by us. And I've also heard, I had a naturalist friend that has reported seeing less and less bugs every year in the Alberta prairie, prairies. So some other plaintiffs experience loss of fish from year to year and Reynolds syndrome aggravated by cold temperatures. So we all are having, we're all experiencing effects from this one issue, but it comes in so many diverse ways as well. Um, so in saying that, we really want to accomplish through this litigation, we want to protect youth and Canadians from these effects and hopefully in doing that also help the world as well. So what we ask for is the that the federal government follow and be held accountable to a science-based climate recovery plan with dramatic and timely measures. So 
this will hold the government accountable and make sure that they do have dramatic enough measures to protect our future. Um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Um, and even if we don't win, we still have gotten so much positive feedback from Canadian citizens. It's been a really educational experience for people I've heard. And I think it's really important to share why youth and climate matter um, with the rest of the population. And so in our journey, we're getting there. Last month, the Court of Appeals held a unanimous decision to affirm our right to go to court with this lawsuit, which is super exciting. Um, and so my experience with being a plaintiff is that it's been really positive so far. I've been meeting so many cool people, such as the other plaintiffs, the lawyers, everyone involved in this case is just super awesome. And I've also met other climate activists that are really interested in this work that I'm doing, um, such as David Suzuki, Severin Kala Suzuki, and Gre Greta Thunberg. Um, and I'm also learning so much about the legal system. It's really interesting and it's so cool to be able to participate in the legal process with meeting with all the other people at our Children's Trust and the David Suzuki Foundation and providing impact statements to say how I'm being affected by the climate crisis. And um, as a plaintiff, I'm also really learning how to talk to media about why youth and climate matter. And it's been kind of a learn as I go experience, but I think I've gotten better the, over the years, I hope. <laughs> um, although another thing with the legal system that I've learned, it's really slow as well. So I understand this is how the legal system works, but it still is frustrating sometimes because the climate crisis is getting worse every year and every year it'll get harder and harder to turn the ship around. So it's also frustrating as well because it's slowed down because of the government's motion to strike being accepted and having to go to the court of appeals. So with that, I will say that I did cry in my grade eight science class when the government's motion to strike was accepted and our case was struck down um, because I just couldn't understand why the judge didn't side, of, side with us because the effects of climate change on young people are so evident to me. I was confused and upset and I honestly still am. I don't understand why the governments are choosing to ignore this issue for their own benefit as much as they are. They are choosing short-term prof profit over long-term safety and security. And that is so worrying to me and it makes me feel very powerless. So it's affecting me, my fellow plaintiffs, Canadian citizens, people all around the world, and I'm sure some of you as well. So with that, I think all the people involved in this lawsuit, we really worked together and like really had a positive attitude going into the Court of Appeals and coming off of the government's motion to strike um, just because there's so many amazing people in this lawsuit and we're all just working hard to protect youth's future and yeah, try and turn the ship around a little bit. And so I was so excited when the Court of Appeals decided that our case was acceptable for the federal courts last month. And I'm really looking forward to go to the federal courts in the future. And I honestly really love being a part of this case. It feels like I'm actually doing something whether it's making a change or not. It's lifting the feeling of helplessness and eco-anxiety, I would say. Of course, all the eco-anxiety doesn't just go away, but it helps. Honestly, if we succeed or not in our case, I think that we've really gotten the word out there that young people are suing the government for inadequate climate action. And I think that's really super important. So yeah, that's my talk. Thank you so much.
Thanks so much. We, um, we really appreciate that. Uh, I don't know if you could hear the round of applause in the room, uh, but people were applauding. Uh, I just got to say, boy, the government better watch out when it goes to trial because you're going to be a fantastic witness. Uh, and I hope you get your chance to testify, even though I'm sure that that will feel like you're just being traumatized uh, again by having to tell your story in the courtroom. It's such a powerful story and you tell it so well. So thanks very, very much. Um, Thank you. I'm going to introduce Chris now. Um, so Chris has played a variety of roles in his legal career for over 30 years. He's been a full-time law professor at the University of Victoria, just across the Salish Sea from where we are right now, uh, teaching criminal and environmental law to hundreds of JD students. He's also been a pioneer in clinical legal education, serving for more than 20 years as executive director of UVic's um, amazing environmental law center, and six years ago established the Pacific Center for Environmental Law and Litigation, known as CEL, which is Canada's first experiential program in public, public interest environmental litigation for law students and junior lawyers. He's published widely on environmental law uh, topics including access to justice, forest certification, contaminated sites, indigenous rights and cumulative effects, climate litigation and slap suits, strategic lawsuits against public participation. Um, in August of last year, the publisher Thomson Reuters published the fourth edition of the National Environmental Law Textbook. Uh, which I use in my environmental law course, of which Chris is the co-author, along with um, the recently departed Professor Meinhard Dwell. Uh, may he rest in peace. Chris is an experienced and busy litigator. Starting out as a criminal defense lawyer, he pra his practice nowadays focuses on serving public interest and indigenous clients. He's been a counsel, counsel to a variety of high-profile cases including the Northern Gateway Pipeline, Trans Mountain Pipeline, Northwest LNG Pipeline, and Tech Frontier. His firm, Tollefson Law, is co-counsel on La Rose Against Canada, which we are talking about today. Uh, he's re received numerous awards for his research and teaching, including Nature Canada's Conservation Partner Award and for his work leading their legal team during the Northern Gateway pipeline hearings. A key theme throughout his career has been public participation and access to justice. He published the first Canadian Law Journal article on SLAPS in the Canadian Bar Review. Over the next decade or so, he was a leading advocate for and assisted in the drafting of anti-SLAP legislation that was enacted in BC and Ontario. Last year, he represented conservationist Ezra Morse in securing dismissal of a slap suit dealing with proposed development of some land around Qualicum in BC. Um, a case, I should just finish with what I'm reading rather than trying to ad lib. So that was a case many consider to be the first environmental law slap to be litigated under BC's newly reinstated anti-slap law. That's where my notes conclude, so I'll hand it over to Chris. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stepan, for that very generous uh, introduction. Thank you for, as well, the invitation to be part of this webinar series. I think it really is a terrific vehicle, and I love how it profiles the stories, the, uh, the role of these young, of these incredible young people. Uh, on that topic, thank you, Sadie, for those introductory comments. I, I do a lot of media. I do a lot of talks like this with our remarkable group of plaintiffs, and I'm always, always so impressed by their poise and insight. And um, uh, so what I want to do today is to build on what Sadie has said. I want to provide you folks with, uh, with an overview of the case situated a little bit. Um, it's been going for a while, as Sadie notes. Uh, there's still um, uh, a bit of distance ahead of us. 
want to talk about um, that. I want to talk about um, because this is a legal audience. I think you might be interested in hearing a little bit about the legal theory and how that developed and evolved um, and is reflected in the case. Uh, and then I want to talk about the journey um, so far of this case through the courts. Um, as Stepan has mentioned, it was filed um, in 20, 2019, um, struck by the uh, federal court uh, a year later in 2020. Um, and now, some three years later, uh, it has been reinstated. The appeal that we brought has been allowed and the court, and we'll talk more about the court's decision, the Court of Appeals decision, but it's been essentially ordered to go to trial. We have some work to do to make that happen, but um, the Court of Appeal has said this matter deserves and should go to trial. In 2019, while we filed this case, uh, uh, it wasn't the first youth-led climate case. Um, by a few months, there was another case that beat us to that. Uh, that case is not going on anymore, um, but it was an interesting case as well. Uh, I'll mention it for the historical record. Um, Anjou is an uh, environmental group uh, in Quebec that brought that case. It was brought as a class action under Quebec's class action legislation. It had an interesting journey through the courts that is now over. Um, uh, let me talk from there about our case and, 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 and where it fits into this picture. So we filed our case probably only a few months after Anjou filed theirs. Um, at that time, we were and we still are the only national uh, youth-led climate case. Uh, there's a variety of other cases, including Mathur, that you know about um, that are out there, but we are still the only case that is truly national in scope, and it's the only case uh, that's youth-led uh, in our federal courts. I'm going to talk as well a bit later about some of the distinctions between our case and other ones. It's important, though, I think, at the outset to recognize as well that what we are seeking, what our plaintiffs are seeking, is a full civil trial on the merits with scientists, with government people, but most importantly, with our plaintiffs giving evidence, which we say at the end of the day will support our claims under the charter. Um, the claim is also, I think, um, unique amongst those youth led cases that I've referred to. It's unique in terms of its scope. It um, alleges over a long period of time, the city's talked about this, over a long period of time, we say that Canada has been engaged in a course of conduct um, that now, here and now and into the future, breaches these young people's rights through the actions and through the inaction of this government on climate change. We say there has been a serious and ongoing charter breach. Our plaintiffs are a broad and, and diverse group hailing from virtually every province and territory across this country. A majority of them uh, identify or associated with uh, Indigenous nations uh, uh, around this country. And I have to say uh, that I am really proud of the whole group, all 15 for how they have stood up, uh, how resilient they have been during this first stage over the last four years or so. Um, as Sadie has talked about, one of the things I think that has caused them to step forward is that they are all suffering now and have been suffering uh, the effects of global climate change. This is a case where we're not complaining about what might happen. We're obviously concerned about that. That is part of the theory, but we're talking about what's happening now. 
and what has already happened to these young people. With that in mind, let me segue then to the legal theory that we have advanced and, and the context in which it arose. This case was developed more than four years ago. It was filed four years ago, but it was under development. We were talking about it with the plaintiffs and others through 2017 and 2018. Back then, Canada had no, and maybe people would say this is still the case, Canada had no distinct or identifiable climate policy or law. Um, the net zero law, such as it is, was still a few years off. Um, and that presented an interesting question from a legal point of view. How do you attack inaction? How do you proceed where there is no obvious law to strike down? Rather, what's going on, we would say, is very much there's government conduct all over the map here government action and inaction all over the place action in terms of subsidizing fossil fuel companies exploration and development acquisition of fossil fuel infrastructure including buying the tmx pipeline but also a lot of inaction consistent failures to fulfill promises to set targets, to make fighting climate change a real priority. Um, so we wanted to develop a legal theory that re reflected that reality, that called out that reality for what it is. Um, both under Section 7, which is a provision that you're probably familiar with, the provision that protects life, liberty, and security of the person, but also under the quality rights provision, which we say is in play here because of how the government conduct that we're impugning disadvantages this very distinct group of plaintiffs by virtue of their age and by, their, by virtue of their generational positioning. So our decision was to, to frame it as a claim that focused broadly on a cool constellation of action and inaction over time. And this is a pretty novel framing. Normally charter cases do target a single law or maybe a few laws. Um, in this regard though, we, our case is quite similar to another case that you will be talking about, which is the Juliana case versus the US government that was filed a few years before us and, and very much um, has adopted the same legal theory. In the Canadian setting, among other things, the breadth is obviously something novel, but the other part of this legal theory that is, um, I think, groundbreaking is that we are saying that Section 7 protects not only negative but pro positive rights. And this is, I don't know if this is something we'll get into in the discussion. But I want to touch on it because it's an important um, reason why the Federal Court of Appeals uh, decision is so important. What we are seeking to do is to have Canada cease harmful actions that are impacting our plaintiffs. That's the more conventional part of the, of the claim. That's a negative rights claim. We're, you have to, we say you have to stop doing, you have to come up with a plan that ceases brings to a halt these various actions subsidies and so on that we say are causing the harm um, but we say the case goes beyond that it's not just about the negative rights claim we also say that there is under section seven in certain cases uh the potential for for plaintiffs to argue that government must take affirmative action. They must take positive steps to protect the rights of young Canadians in this case. And it's that dimension of the case that is the so-called positive rights claim. Now, um, we'll get into a little bit more what the court says about this as well, both courts, uh, I think, have something to say about this positive rights claim, but just park that for a minute. 
That is something we deliberately chose to put in play. We say our case is both a, a traditional negative rights claim as well as a positive rights claim. Um, the response of Canada to this lawsuit was somewhat predictable. As most governments do, they move immediately to strike. They move immediately to summarily dismiss the claim um, before any trial can happen, before it can be um, heard and decided on the merits. Um, and they made a variety of arguments in support of that. They first of all said that the case was non-justiciable, which is to say that it doesn't belong in the courts, that it is too complicated, it's too infused by policy, it's too political. In our case, that the claim is simply too broad for the courts to grapple with. Um, they also argued that the case had no reasonable chance of winning, that it had no reasonable cause of action and in particular, they pointed to the positive rights claim as saying that is a novel claim that has never been held on the merits, um, upheld on the merits by any Canadian court. And um, as Sadie has noted, uh, we had a hearing in front of Justice Manson, and he largely, not entirely, but largely agreed with Canada. He said the claim was too broad and amorphous. He said it was too infused with policy. In his view, those things made it non-justiciable. It was simply a claim that courts shouldn't and couldn't decide. He also didn't like the remedy that we were seeking. And Sadie's, I think, very nicely described what we were seeking was a court-supervised science-based climate recovery plan that set targets for what government needed to do. And, you know, in terms of some parameters of what a plan would look like and had court supervision. Judge didn't like that either. He said that was also non-justiciable. Interestingly though, Justice Manson did not say, did not say that our positive rights claim was doomed to fail. He didn't strike it on that footing. He said it was non-justiciable, shouldn't go ahead, but he didn't completely dismiss it, which is interesting if we turn then to the next chapter in this, and it didn't happen until a few years later, um, in February of 2023 and COVID and various things intervened to delay things. 2023, we argued it in the Federal Court of Appeal over Zoom. And uh, just uh, uh, this past month, uh, December 13th, actually, of, of uh, 2023, we got this unanimous decision from the Federal Court of Appeal. Um, I think everybody immediately recognized it was an important decision in the world of climate litigation. But I, I think I wanna also in, uh, reinforce for you that it's an important case in terms of the charter, charter interpretation, and it's an important case for access to justice. So I think these young people really deserve kudos um, for prevailing here in the federal court of this case will be one that gets cited in a lot of different settings i think it really is an important case for different reasons number one is that i think it pushes back on this idea that courts can retreat into this idea that things are non-justiciable and therefore they don't have to deal with them it clarifies that courts have to where the claim is tethered to legal precedent. They have to deal with complicated cases. They have to deal with cases that are infused with policy. They have to deal with broad claims. As long as there is that legal tether, that is their job. Um, and you can see how broadly that potentially could apply across, um, across a variety of different settings. Um, as well on the point of remedy, by the way, Sadie brought up, um, the court says we shouldn't prejudge whether a remedy is non-justiciable. That should be left to the trial judge. It's really in the context of hearing all the facts, all the legal arguments, that a court can properly decide if a remedy is non-justiciable. It's way too early in the process to decide that as soon as the case is filed, as, as happened here. 
Um, I think another reason why this is such an important case, not just to climate litigation, but more broadly, is the court's affirmation about the historic and enduring and important role courts play uh, in hearing novel claims, uh, in entertaining novel claims, and in the right cases, in moving the needle, in actually advancing and evolving the law. You know, and I think it was partly because of that uh, affirmation, that notion that courts have that important role to play in appropriate cases, that they say here that this is a case, this Section 7 claim these young people have brought, this is a case where the positive rights claim, although it's never been upheld on the facts in any case before, this is a right case, a correct um situation for that claim to go ahead and in fact they go further and this is really interesting the court says and and this goes back to um uh, the supreme court of canada case that talks about positive rights the one leading case called goslin in goslin they say that we're not sure if there are positive rights under section seven but if they do exist it would be in a very exceptional circumstance and the Federal Court of Appeal in LaRoe says that they could, they cannot imagine a more appropriate case to meet that test. That if there ever is a case that meets the exceptional circumstance test, it would be this one. Um, finally, uh, you know, I, th I think an issue certainly is that this is a broadly framed, a broadly pleaded case. Um, and the court recognizes that, recognizes it's unwieldy. Uh, but they say that isn't a reason for it not to go to trial. That's a reason for, for their lawyers, for these plaintiff lawyers, uh, to refine and recraft them. And um, uh, basically, the uh, court is saying, get to work, redraft the claim, figure out how to efficiently put it before the court, and we'll get it on for trial. Where I want to finish, and I'm mindful that this is a series, a webinar series, so I want to situate LaRose a little bit. I've already talked about Juliana and how our theory is similar to theirs. I want to situate LaRose a little bit, especially in relation to the Mathur litigation. Obviously, there's similarities. Um, Mathur was filed a few months after LaRose. They're both youth-led. They both argue Section 7 and 15 of the Charter. But there are some significant differences that you should know about. One is that the legal theory, the form of the argument in Mathur is quite different from LaRose. In Mathur, it is focused on a specific legal enactment and a, and a repeal of a law in Ontario. In that sense, it's a more conventional Charter case it's focused on arguing that this repeal and this new law, which is much less ambitious, um, sets much less ambitious targets for Ontario, are unconstitutional. So we would say that Mathur is in the category of a targets case. It's about inadequate targets being set that breach the charter. And of course, Mathur is targeting the actions of a province, not the whole nation of Canada, although I think that ought not to make a difference and so far doesn't seem to have been a difference that the courts care a lot about. The other difference from a legal theory point of view is that LaRose, as I've said, is explicitly a positive and a negative rights claim. We, we rely on both aspects of Section 7. Mathur has been a little bit more circumspect and has claimed so far anyway to be, the plaintiffs have claimed in that case to be a negative, a traditional negative rights case. Um, and um, it's interesting in, in uh, the Ontario Superior Court, and now it was argued in the Ontario Court of Appeal, the courts don't really agree with that characterization. They think there's a positive rights claim in there. And so the back and forth between the plaintiff's lawyers and the court has been very interesting to watch. And I, I do think that when we get in a decision from the Ontario Court of Appeal in Mathur, they're going to talk about positive and negative rights. Um, and that will obviously have some relevance to our litigation. 
The other thing, and I'll, and I'll finish with this, the other thing that's different about Mathur in our case is that Mathur chose a more speedy route to get to a hearing on the merits. They chose a procedure in Ontario that allowed for the court to make a decision on the merits just based on affidavits and cross-examination on affidavits. Um, the actual hearing in Mathur was only a few days in length. And that is why they've been able um, to, to uh, get uh, so far in their litigation. They didn't have a full trial on the merits with witnesses, um, with discovery. It's a, it's a strategic choice. We, we believe we want to have a full trial. We want to have witnesses. Um, it's going to take longer. Um, I know Sadie and, and, and her colleagues are up to it, but it is it's going to take longer. And I guess I would finish with this, that, you know, I, I know the Mathur lawyers. I haven't had a chance to meet the Mathur plaintiffs, but I have greatest respect for those guys. And I think for all of us that are working here on this file, on the, on the litigation side of things, we do, I think, want to support each other. And it's great that um, there are difference. There's some differences and and competing approaches and competing arguments out there, and it's great as well that we're working so closely with OCT, the Juliana lawyers um, uh, on this stuff. It's a small community so far. We're hoping to build it, um, and I know some of Sadie's colleagues are already going to law school. Uh, some of the plaintiffs and and some of you guys are going on on to do science degrees. So we see this as a long-term project and um, um, we're glad to be part of it. And, uh, and we're certainly very pleased to be on to the next stage. I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you so very much, Chris. Um, we are open for questions. Uh, I'll give people a minute to get their gears rolling, but uh, I would invite questions from inside the room, which I, well, actually, uh, we have microphones at the desks. So if anyone uh, has a question they wanna ask in the room, if I call on you, you just press the button in the center of the microphone there. And when you see the solid red light, you're able to speak. Uh, and if anyone uh, has a question online, we have the Q&A uh, and um, Kylie, the coordinator of the Center for Law and the Environment is monitoring that. And Kylie will let us know if there are um, questions. Does anyone want to start us off? Okay, I see a question in the room. So Avery, if you wouldn't mind. Hello, um, thank you both for your uh, time and your presentation. I had a question, of, um, I think mostly directed at Chris, but um, Sadie, if you have an opinion, please, I'd love to hear it. Um, I was reading both the federal court and then court of appeal decisions, and I looked up the different justices who wrote the opinions. And what I noticed is that the federal court of appeal justices all had a background in constitutional or public law litigation prior to um, serving on the court, whereas the um, federal court judge was a IP specialist, it looked like, at least from his bi biography. And so I was wondering whether or not you think that, like, judges' backgrounds and, like, expertise plays a role in their receptiveness or um, their ability to kind of wade through arguments when they're more broadly framed or more novel, as is in this case, and um, whether or not that informs your strategy when you find out who you're going to be arguing bef uh, before and whether or not you think um, cases like this need, you know, a certain degree of expertise uh, on the, uh, in terms of who's adjudicating them. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I guess I start from this proposition that certainly as a lawyer, as a litigator, it's important once you know who you're going to be appearing in front of to do a bit of studying, do a little bit of research about that person or those people. And it's interesting that you did that. I think that's a good way to approach things. Um, what, you, what you'll find out is what they've said in reported cases. Uh, maybe you'll find out where they practice law, what area. Um, that will give you somewhat of a picture. Um, 
uh, I don't necessarily subscribe to the view that um, for constitutional cases, you have to have been a lawyer that practiced in that area, have a special interest in it. Um, it can, I suppose, help. I, but at the same time, you you know, you could be a constitutional law spe specialist, but um, skew to quite a conservative approach to the role of courts in in that realm. Uh, you know, so so the, the the realm in which you practice is ne not necessarily a predictor to how robust you will be as a judge. Um, and I I still remember. Um, and it, uh, I'll try to disguise this a little bit, but when I was on the board of EcoJustice, uh, they were litigating a case, an environmental assessment case um, about mining. And they did some research on the judge and they found out that the judge had basically just worked for mining companies during his career. They're quite worried about that. Turned out though that that judge knew so much about mining, he knew all the workarounds, all the ways that you could scam environmental assessment, that he was the perfect judge. He totally saw through what was going on, called it out, and that case has become a major precedent um, going forward. So I would, I guess I would say this, do the research, figure out what you can from the public record about the judge, then ask people, you know, if you're if you're going to be appearing uh, in front of a judge, put it, put out the word and find out some stuff about them, and then try to tailor your submissions a little bit in that vein. Um, uh, but I don't think ne it's necessarily a good idea to judge a book by its cover. So be careful um, uh, about making any conclusions. Okay, I think my mic is working. Um, thanks so much for the question and for the answer. Uh, we have a system in the room where the camera is supposed to turn to the person whose mic is activated, but I don't think it did that uh, that time around. Um, we're working on that so, uh, so that uh, Sadie and Chris, you can actually see the person who's asking the question. Um, but uh, you know tech. Um, no matter how many years we're in this online world, we still can't manage the technology. Um, okay, I see another question, a couple of questions in the room, and um, I'll invite uh, this one first. So you got to press the button on your mic, and let's see what happens. Hello. Thank you for your time and for coming to, to speak with us today. I guess one of the questions that I would ask focusing on the LaRose case that in, on one of the differences from the Mather case is how do you grapple with the scale and how broad this case is and what actions um, to allege the impugned conduct be? And, and let's say you do go into a trial and you do go through discovery. How do you manage to find out what you want to discover from whether it's the purchase of a pipeline to maybe a more local impact where a specific deer population doesn't have the same migratory pattern? And, how do you grapple with what you're going to talk about? Yeah, again, that's a really good question. Um, I think we're grappling with it right now, I guess, is the honest answer. Um, when you file a case, I think, and you know that you're going to face a motion to dismiss, your focus is really on trying to make your case bulletproof from that outcome. And, and in grappling with the arguments that are being thrown at you, but we're now at a new stage. We have an interesting opportunity ahead of us, which is to recraft and update the claim. Now there is new laws, or there are new laws um, that um, we should address as part of our theory. So I would just say, stay tuned. I'm sorry if that sounds flippant, but I can't really share much more than that. Sadie, do you have thoughts? I don't have too, too much thoughts. Um, yeah, I'm going to go into a major in biology. So I am going to try and research the effects of climate change and how 
and like yeah maybe research findings will be used as evidence in these cases so yeah that's my take on it I don't I don't I'm not too educated on all the law stuff uh, if I can just add before going to the next uh, question for the benefit of folks who are not right up to speed with the Federal Court of Appeals decision, it uh, said that the plaintiffs have permission to amend their pleadings. And the idea is that the, the, the court called on them to uh, amend their pleadings to make clearer what the nexus or link is between specific actions or conduct of the federal government and the deprivation of their rights, which strikes me as a real challenge because it's as if they don't get the theory of the case, which is that it's the entire course of conduct. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Chris, before we um, move to the next. Well, that's quite, that's quite right. Um, what's, I guess I, I wouldn't, want to comment further on that directly, but I would add this, which is that the court, it's unusual um, how they grapple with this a little bit. I mean, it's not unusual for a court where they think you have a claim, but it's too broad or there's something wrong with it to give you a chance to amend. But, but here, they've given us some directions about that. And one of the things that's very interesting is that they say that we under, basically, we understand why it's broadly pleaded and, and that creates some problems. You need to fix that, but we don't want, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, we don't want Canada, if you make it a more narrow claim, to say it's too narrow and therefore is non-justiciable or that somehow the causal link has been attenuated to the point where there's no claim. Um, it's, I think, very rare for a court to get in uh, to that level of detail in terms of its instructions. So Canada will be reading this just as closely as us. Um, and I think in a sense, we'll have to work, we may have to work with Canada a little bit on this to come up with um, a pleading uh, that can go to trial. Thanks. Okay. We have another question. So if you'd like to ask your question, you have to press the button on the microphone and see if that works. Thank you for the old speeches. Uh, I just wonder, uh, you said that uh, this is a uh, positive uh, right claims uh, case. So I wonder if you use in your petition or in the case law, uh, the European uh, human rights court decisions or European cases and this is why I am asking th this one is if do you believe that is it possible to make a, a global understanding of uh, state responsibility on climate change thank you um absolutely the jurisprudence that has developed the furthest on this arises under the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, although there are in some national settings um, interesting cases on this, the Neubauer case in Germany um, looks at the basic law, German's constitution, Germany's constitutional law, and talks about duties governmental duties that are associated with rights uh, in a vein uh, that I think is quite helpful and instructive. So what the, what the Court of Appeal has asked us to do here is, you know, gives us a real opportunity, but also a big responsibility to help guide forward um, our understanding, the case law, on what does it mean um, to be a positive right. When the Mathur uh, lawyers were in court recently, um, I think they made some interesting submissions about how blurry the line is between positive and negative and how already under our charter, uh, well, we don't 
acknowledge it, um, that we uh, frequently are imposing positive duties um, on the crown uh, in various settings, often in the criminal law setting. So um, there's much thinking to be done. I think that uh, the European cases uh, are helpful. Uh, but we have to find a, a made in Canada approach here. Um, and so uh, we're grateful for that chance. Thank you again, Chris. Um, we have around five more minutes, so do come up with your questions. But in the meantime, I'd like to ask Sadie a question, if that's OK. Sadie, you talked about eco-anxiety um, and uh, your experience of the sort of negative emotions associated with the climate crisis and frustration at um, the inaction of the powers that be. Um, this is something that people all around the world are experiencing, and it's especially young people experiencing these feelings. Can you tell us anything about how you deal with those in your everyday life or in the context of this lawsuit? Yeah, for sure. It is a super big question and how, how like how so many people are struggling with this. Um, for me personally, since I'm so passionate about biology and the outdoors, I really find my recharge in going skiing or going hiking. Um, and I recognize my privilege in that I do have access to these outdoor places to have this bit of a recharge, but it's really nice for me because it helps in two ways it helps me like see the world in its beauty and like why I want to protect it and it so it calms me down and like gives me perspective on how big the world is but it also reminds me of my motivation of why I'm suing the federal government because I want to protect these natural outdoor places as well as Canadian youth. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I didn't mean to put you on the spot for something that could be difficult to talk about. Um, there is another question, it looks like, and Kylie knows how to use the mic. Uh, so this is an online question um, from Marie uh, asking um, if you could speak briefly about remedy, uh, what you're seeking, uh, and how would a victory be implemented by government, uh, given that it seems challenging for a court uh, to give sufficient direction? Absolutely. Happy to talk about that. Um, in... Uh, crafting and in, in, in arguing for a remedy, I think we have to be really careful um, not to put the court in a position um, that um, creates um, uh, difficulties in terms of its either its capacity or its desire to, res to respect um, the separation of powers. Um, so in, in our pleading, we ask for uh, and remedially, we ask for two things, um, and they're both very important. One is a declaration that the course of conduct that we've identified does breach uh, the Charter. And, and we uh, are confident that a declaration of that kind would have a powerful spotlighting effect, would have um, uh, some value on its own. Um, we, we though, uh, as well believe in this situation where there, there's a proven record of failures to discharge its duties over time. In a situation like that, courts should and, and do step in to make sure that governments fix things. Um, and we, and so what we would want to see in um, in terms of a, a, a remedy would be uh, for the court to uh, elaborate um, the parameters of the requirements of a science-based climate recovery plan 
um, uh, that would leave it up to government to figure out how to do it, but would set um, uh, some clear, measurable, and binding outcomes uh, for government to stay focused on and for, and for the court to stay involved and uh, periodically uh, check in to see how to see how that is going. So that's our vision. And it and that kind of remedy is very common in the US, not so common in Canada, but not unknown. Uh, quick technical question. Well, it's more than technical, though, I guess. Um, what's the deadline for filing a notice of appeal of the Federal Court of Appeals decision? And uh, do you have any inklings whether the government will appeal this decision? Um, we haven't heard from Canada about that yet. I think they're still in time. Um, we've, uh, as you can imagine, time of year and, and other competing things on our plates. It's been difficult to bring all the plaintiffs and their lawyers together. So we're still in the process of caucusing. And, and uh, yeah, we're going to be interested to see what Canada does. Um, and uh, we'll know soon. Any um, final questions in the room? Okay, we have one more question. Uh, thank you both. I have a question for Sebi. You mentioned that the eco anxiety not affects you, but also your friends when, when you make like decisions about your future. Would you mind share if like, like our collective future, the not so promising one uh, affects your plan for your future, your personal future? Thank you. Yeah, so I um, have, I do really want to go to university for biology and try to come back. Um, I want to focus on the diversity loss that is being um, created because of the climate crisis, because I believe as humans um, who are creating this sixth mass extinction of our planet that we have a responsibility to try and reverse it. I have some friends that, like I said, um, are nervous to have children in this world, um, not just based on climate crisis, Large, a lot of that but also like um other conflicts and stuff um and I believe that cl the climate crisis is such a huge issue that even if youth aren't thinking about it as much as I am it's still going to affect everyone and um people are gonna have to make some decisions as well and I know that my city is doing a lot of fortifying barriers for floods and um, making a lot of um, informing citizens about the dangers of wildfire smoke and so as um, someone who is going to be graduating high school um, and friends with so many other people that are graduating high school as we're leaving um, and looking forward into our future I think it's really scary to see um, how the climate crisis is affecting us now and how it's going to affect us in the future so I think the strategy of some people is just to try and ignore it um, that's not my preferred strategy because I feel that it gets overwhelming and I feel that it feels better, um, with the eco anxiety if I do stuff, but yeah, I think looking into our future, it can be really scary, but there can be some hopeful things as well, like this lawsuit, I would say. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Well, thank you so very much. Um, yeah, stay strong uh, and 
both of you are such inspirations uh, for us and for other people. Um, I will just uh, close by inviting everyone in the room to make themselves heard online in applauding. So thanks so much. And thank you to those who joined us online uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye now. Yeah, thank you.